Um, let me just begin with the term affirmative action. At least from my research, uh, I think it was first used uh, as a label to describe this kind of policy, particularly in employment, um, in the Kennedy administration. And whether you're for it or against it, I think that it's a little bit better label, affirmative action, than what the British use for this kind of policy, which is positive discrimination which sounds a little bit like an oxymoron to me, but maybe that's just me. Um, but there it is, um, a little bit like deliberate speed, I think. Um, so what we wanna do now is show you a clip from President Johnson, uh, who in 1965 gave a speech at Howard University in Washington, D.C. It's held outdoors, uh, so you'll hear a little bit of wind in the microphone, but he speaks a little bit about what he considers to be the philosophy of what came to be known as affirmative action. So it lasts a little bit over a minute. So with that, if our technical crew will run it, we'll watch it together. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Thus, it is not enough just to open the gates of opportunity. All our citizens must have the ability to walk through those gates. And this is the next and the more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. We seek not just freedom, but opportunity. We seek not just legal equity, but human ability. Not just equality as a right and a theory, but equality as a fact and equality as a result. With that, uh, and by the way, you can watch that entire speech uh, on the Miller Center's Presidential Speech Archive that is curated by our wonderful Scripps librarian, uh, Sheila Blackford, who also uh, is the curator for our American President uh, website, which has essays on all of the presidents. But we thought we would start with, with Lyndon Johnson, who in his own way so different from President Kennedy and, and how he spoke and how he presented things, but that analogy that he uses of, of bringing the person who's been hobbled for generations and bring that person up to the starting line and say, okay, we'll fire off the gun and now you have every opportunity to run the race, uh, is I think very, um, you know, sort of pointed and, and very easy to comprehend. Um, in addition to which you might know that he began his career not as a politician, but as a teacher uh, in Catula, Texas, uh, teaching very, very underprivileged uh, poor Mexican Americans. And he would say, I, I saw in their bright faces that they wanted to learn and I wanted to teach them, but I also knew what they had already had to try to overcome, even as grade schoolers, and how much more they had to overcome. And that really becomes his philosophy of support for civil rights. And just the year prior to this, when he gave this speech in 1965, he had signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which will be at the crux of our conversation today. So with that, I'm gonna to turn to my colleague, Kevin Gaines, uh, who as a civil rights historian and social justice historian, I thought might bring us a little bit of the basis of that speech and the Kennedy administration and into the employment realm because it's really first in the employment realm that we see this concept of affirmative action and then we'll move into the education field. So with that, Kevin, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Barbara. Um, yes, as, as you said, um, JFK was the person who coined the term affirmative action with uh, his executive order and he meant affirmative action that the, the federal government had uh, a responsibility to take affirmative action in cases of discrimination and also to study, uh, you know, uh, 
problems of discrimination in various industries. And uh, really the issue, the, if you think about the evolution of affirmative action since uh, its inception, it's very closely tied with presidential politics. And we saw a very important example of that with uh, LBJ's clip. Uh, Johnson also kind of reaffirmed uh, JFK's notion of uh, affirmative action in an executive order. But that speech um, is really seen as setting the tone for sort of the political content, the intellectual content of affirmative action policies going forward. Um, it's kind of ironic that affirmative action was, was sort of dreamed up as a policy under these democratic administrations. Uh, but it's the Nixon administration, a Republican administration, that actually implemented affirmative action under his Department of Labor with uh, something called the Philadelphia Plan. And this was in line with, with how Johnson and Kennedy understood affirmative action. That it was really going to address uh, disparities in employment. It was going to address the, you know, the historic exclusion of African Americans from, uh, uh, in the case of the Philadelphia Plan, uh, construction jobs and construction unions. And so um, people may wonder, uh, it, it may sort of go against their understanding of, of, of Nixon to wonder why Nixon is the person who implemented it. I think with Nixon, it's a case of doing the right thing for you know, sort of questionable reasons. Um, Nixon was really addressing a real problem in terms of, in, in the city of Philadelphia and other major cities, the exclusion of African Americans from skilled uh, uh, unions for, you know, sort of uh, federal contract, uh, municipal contract jobs. So there was uh, a, a, a problem of discrimination and exclusion. Nixon wanted to do this, and he did it, pushing back against a fair amount of opposition from people in his own party, because really his, his kind of hidden agenda was to try to sort of uh, use affirmative action as a wedge issue to, um, to divide two reliable Democratic par Party constituencies, uh, which is African Americans and organized labor. So for a brief moment, Nixon is putting pressure on the leaders of uh, these, these um, uh, construction unions to um, integrate. Um, when, during the Vietnam War, it turns out that the people who are supporting Nixon's war policy are, you know, the construction workers, the hard hat guys who are, you know, in, in, the, in the midst of, of anti-war activity, these are his guys who are supporting the Vietnam War policy. Nixon decides, oh, you know what, I think I'm going to just uh, pull back on the policy and make you know, compliance voluntary instead of enforced. Um, so presidential politics is, is kind of a, a, a through line. Uh, I, I, I recall in, uh, well, I mean, it's really important to think about the, the impact of uh, the new right and the Reagan-Bush uh, years in reframing the discussion of race away from LBJ's notion of rights and you know, sort of group-based equity to you know, a discussion that sort of sees uh, civil rights and affirmative action as reverse racism or reverse discrimination and you know, a, a kind of a, uh, a conservative idea of race that, you know, uh, that doesn't really want to sort of look at historic discrimination or um, you know, racial disparities and, and just basically declaring uh, our society equal and we have equality, so there's no need for any kind of anti-discrimination reform in policy. And you know, that is something that Bill Clinton ran up against. Uh, you have a, a very sharp and focused political attack on affirmative action uh, during the Clinton administration uh, with a lot of pressure from conservative a uh, operatives and a lot of that kind of uh, rhetoric that really sort of, um, that really um, elevates this notion of uh, the, the, the harm to whites caused by affirmative action uh, over a notion of a broader social benefit and a social justice uh, you know, basis or justification for affirmative action. So Clinton finally, after a lot of the pressure that he's getting from um, folks who are uh, against affirmative action, you know, makes a great speech where he says, mend it, don't end it. And I think a lot of people, even supporters of affirmative action, understood that you know, there were 
um, issues that needed to sort of be worked out and, 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 and tinkered with. Um, but just to go back, I guess the Supreme Court <laughs> is a big part of this, this history. And um, I think a landmark is the Bakke decision in 1978, in which uh, Lewis Powell, in uh, his majority opinion, made the argument that uh, even though um, the, the decision ruled in Bakke's favor, Bakke was a, a, a white man who had sued the University of California because he had been denied admission to medical school. Um, and so the court ruled in Bakke's favor and granted him uh, admission. But uh, Lewis Powell said that um, universities and professional schools did have uh, a responsibility to, um, to include race as one of those factors in uh, uh, admissions process, and that you know, universities and other you know, uh, American institutions have a, you know, a compelling state interest in diverse student bodies in higher education. And that was really the basis for uh, the, you know, the, the settled law around affirmative action for a number of years for, until, obviously, just recently. Well, absolutely. And so thank you, Kevin, for that background. And I have a little question now for our audience, OK? Um, how many of you remember where you were, should you have been alive at the time, on November 22nd, 1963, when you heard that President Kennedy had been shot? Okay, I'll get another group here. How many of you remember where you were when you heard about the 9-11 attacks? Okay. How many of you remember where you were when you heard the Bakke decision had come down? <laughs> there are just a few of us. Okay, I remember I was standing uh, on a sidewalk at Oxford. Uh, I was there for a summer program and I was standing outside of a pub and no, I was not drinking on the sidewalk because I don't like beer. Um, but I had started to study the Bakke case uh, as a senior in college, and I had just graduated, so I couldn't wait to hear what the court was going to do. So as Kevin said, the courtly Richmond, Virginia, to the manor born Justice Lewis Powell um, came down with this, this ruling that split the, have to split the court in the sense that he was that swing voter at the time. So he had said that the reason Alan Bakke should be admitted to the med school at the University of California Davis was that they had been holding aside 16 of their 100 admitted seats for uh, disadvantaged students and that in practice had typically been minority students. So it was math for Justice Powell who said 16 does not equal 84. In other words, if you were white, you were competing for 84 seats. If you were a minority in theory, you were competing for all 100, and you might have 16 set aside for you. So that comported with four conservatives on the court at the time, but they would have gone even farther. So they would have said, under no conditions can you ever include race. Uh, as a factor in admissions. And they certainly said that what University of California Davis Medical School had done was a violation of Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Four more liberal justices, more liberal than Justice Powell, said that not only for, as Kevin said, diversity purposes could higher ed and professional schools to have a diverse group of students and produce a group of graduates and professionals who were diverse and could serve diverse communities. Not only could they do that, but led by Justice Brennan, the four liberals said that in order to correct the discrimination of the past, uh, and it did not violate the 64 Civil Rights Act or the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, but that was a bridge too far for the more moderate Justice Powell. So he is straddling those two camps. So I'll just bring us quickly then up to the Michigan cases and then turn over to Kimberly, who is really our expert on uh, affirmative action in education as a lawyer and as a person who is an expert on education policy. But the Michigan cases that I wrote about come down from the court in 2003. And what Justice O'Connor, who had replaced Justice Powell as the swing voter by 2003, in fact, she's coming towards the end of her Supreme Court career. She'd stepped down in 2005 to re be replaced by Justice Alito. Justice O'Connor picks up the Powell opinion and, and really sets that in, she thought, stone, or at least for what she said was about 25 years, she thought, that diversity as a plus 
uh, that was being used by the Michigan Law School uh, as part of a holistic, individualized conceptualization of each applicant to the law school in order to bring in uh, those who were underrepresented, typically at the Michigan Law School, blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans, that if you fell into any of those three categories, that would be considered a plus along with any other things that the law school admissions people would view as a plus, your experience as well as obviously your grades and your test scores. So on a five to four decision, Justice O'Connor now sets that as the court's ruling and it's the law of the land. But there was another University of Michigan case from the undergraduate school whereby they had decided that they would automatically give 20 bonus points on a point-based system to these underrepresented minority candidates for admission to undergraduate. And with that, and with O'Connor joining to say, no, that's a bridge too far, uh, that's not a plus factor, uh, that's closer to a strict quota that, that they were viewed as you know under, even Justice Powell didn't think that was right and constitutional or legal. So Rehnquist, Chief Justice Rehnquist, writes the opinion striking down the Michigan undergraduate uh, policy of this assigning of 20 points as a bonus to those underrepresented minorities. Also, the court said there was not an individualized or holistic understanding of each individual candidate coming into the pool uh, those applying for. Um, the Michigan undergraduate school. So with that uh, as a background, I'm going to turn things over to Kimberly to say, as a lawyer, uh, as a person who I think you would win the award for teaching in the most numbers of schools here at UVA, um, law, baton, and education, um, bring us up to date. What were the courts doing? And then I'm going to turn to Jean, who has an expertise, as does Kimberly, of having served uh, at the Department of Education uh, at, the, at the U.S. level, but also in Jean's case, having served as Secretary of Education for Pennsylvania. So first, Kimberly's going to talk a little bit about what the courts were doing between the Michigan cases in 2003 up to, let's not quite get into the opinion yet, but up to the case from this past term. And then I'll turn to Jean to say what were states doing, and then we'll really bear down on what the court did this past term. So with that, Kimberly, thank you for being here. Sure. So I want to give a sense of the legal regime that's, being, that's operating here so we can understand what the court did, particularly in a case called uh, Fisher, which is from Texas. So here we're dealing with what's called strict scrutiny. There are three levels of scrutiny under the constitutional um, examination of the Equal Protection Clause. And the most rigorous level of scrutiny is what we're dealing with here, which is called strict scrutiny. So st strict scrutiny has two parts. You look at whether there is a compelling interest, and you look at whether the use of race in this case is what they call narrowly tailored to achieve that compelling interest. The court has recognized a very limited number of compelling interests. So here, the court was focused in the Grutter case and upheld that diversity in higher education has sufficiently important benefits that it would be recognized as a constitutional compelling interest. That's important because you see the court deviating from that in the SFA case, which we'll get to. Um, so to understand what's happening, the, lay of, the law of the land is clearly the Grutter case, and universities are proceeding to use only holistic review to assess the race of applicants as well as other characteristics to admit students. And so this, for the most part, was proceeding. However, what you see is some states eventually start to ban affirmative action. And what you see, in, particularly in the Fisher case, which came out in 2016, is that there the Supreme Court, actually there were two Fisher cases, um, so I'll just tell you about one and two. So here there's a challenge to the University of Texas admissions policy. Well, what's going on in Texas in that time? Texas had actually banned affirmative action. And uh, because of that, it did see a significant dip in admissions. It went for about seven years not considering race at all and solely used what's considered race-neutral alternatives. And what does that mean? They're still trying to achieve diversity because as we saw in the Grutter case, diversity has many important benefits. That includes preparing individuals to function in a diverse workforce, uh, 
creating leaders that are legitimate in the eyes of the citizenry, and helping to have a rigorous dialogue in the classroom where people are engaging in different in pe with people who are unlike themselves. And so the research presented in Gruder that was upheld, um, as well as the research that was presented in the, in the Fisher cases, talked about what the benefits were for diversity. And the court um, definitely continued to recognize those as compelling interests. So what was at stake in the Fisher case is that um, Abigail Fisher came, um, forward and sued about the admissions policy. There were two things happening in the University of Texas at this time. For quite some time, they, because there was a ban on affirmative action, they adopted what's called a 10% plan. And the 10% plan took the top um, graduates from the high schools across Texas and gave them what's called automatic admission. Now I can tell you eventually that number starts to drop to eight and seven percent because there's a large number of people coming out of the schools. But the important thing to understand is that the goal of that 10% plan is to achieve diversity, the benefits of diversity. And the reason that they adopt a 10% plan is the long history of segregation within elementary and secondary schools. That was never fully addressed in substantial part because the court um, really rolled back the requirements for school desegregation. So we achieved significant desegregation when the court was pushing districts to do that, but eventually the court rolls those requirements back somewhat, and we can talk about that if you want to. But the important thing to understand here is because Texas has broad racial segregation or broad racial isolation, some people would call, in their districts, when you take 10% of the students across the state, you get a broad array of racial groups coming to the University of Texas if you admit the top 10%. Um, so that case involved a challenge to the University of Texas that was also considering race in a holistic way for part of its admission. So quite a bit of its class, I think it was over 70%, was admitted under the 10% class, 10% uh, plan. The rest of the class was then admitted in a holistic plan that was very similar to what Harvard was using. It, was, it would be a wide array of factors. And actually, even in Texas, it was, it was sort of a factor of a factor of a factor. In other words, it was one of the metrics they would use, but there was just a broad array of other factors they used. And in the Fisher case, the court upheld that, again, in 2016, as constitutional. The court said that the interest of the University of Texas in having a diverse student body um, was compelling, and they had offered a reasoned, principled explanation for why diversity was important to their institution. They also reaffirmed that the narrow tailoring analysis had been met. So they noticed, noted, for example, that for seven years, Texas had actually tried to achieve diversity without considering race and had failed to do so. And so the, they had very tangible evidence from the ban of affirmative action in, in, ten, in Texas until they began using race again. So they had a very clear metric to show that we did try to achieve diversity with race neutral means and we were not able to. And so with that strong record and evidence that the Texas was seeking to pursue a critical mass, the court ultimately upheld um, the uh, admissions policy at the University of Texas. There's, the decision, although it did uphold it, definitely set a very high bar for institutions who wanted to use affirmative action. In other words, the kind of clear proof that there is no other way, no workable um, race neutral alternatives, uh, was certainly a, a ratcheting up of the legal standard from what had been considered in Grutter, which was merely serious good faith consideration of race neutral alternatives. So the court is definitely starting to ratchet up what's required. It, however, does not make any mention there <clears throat> of the 25 years that was noted in the Grutter case. Um, and so universities understood that to be that they were still able to continue holistic review of applicants to include consideration of their race. And then we sort of move forward to 
the current cases. Right. So you can see why the Miller Center has asked Kevin and Kimberly to be fellows with us and why Russell Riley and I in the oral history program <laughs> often want to have Kimberly and Kevin be part of our interview teams. And um, our fellows program um, is thanks to our wonderful director, executive director and CEO, Bill Antholis, who is here today. And we are grateful uh, for that and for his starting the fellows program. Gene Hickok and I are um, Abraham bookends today, and those of you who might have known Professor Henry Abraham, who taught the Supreme Court and constitutional law in the politics department here at UVA for many years, um, was a, a Holocaust survivor. And his parents got him out of Germany uh, by himself in 1937 as a 15-year-old. And forevermore, he was so grateful to this country, which he served in World War II, uh, gathered evidence for the Nuremberg trials, um, that he devoted his career to constitutional law and studying the Supreme Court. And he was a New Deal Democrat for a while, uh, a little bit like Ronald Reagan, then switched over to the Republican Party for a while, became a neoconservative, as many Jewish intellectuals did. In Henry's case, it was based on affirmative action. Having run for his life uh, because of his religion, um, thank goodness his mother and younger brother got out two years after he did, but his two maiden aunts were exterminated at Auschwitz, and he lost about 16 members of his family. He just couldn't bear the thought of people being judged by anything other than what he called merit. And so the point for Lyndon Johnson when he <coughs> talks about equality of opportunity and equality of result. I can remember in Henry's classes, by this time he's a neocon, before I should say, by the way, in 2016, he switched back to the Democratic Party. <laughs> uh, because he said to me, I I'm watching the Republican convention in Cleveland, and he said, I haven't heard some rhetoric like that since I left Germany in 1937. And I thought, OK, I'm listening. Go ahead. You've, you've heard and watched history, but tell me what you're seeing. But in any event, um, he was always bothered by that concept of not just equality of, of opportunity, which he fully supported, but equality of result. And another reason that he had such a hard time with the admissions policies of university being based on race was that when at his first job at the University of Pennsylvania, um, he was told one year when he asked his chair, could I be put up for a promotion? The uh, chairman said, I'm sorry, Hank, we've already promoted a Jew this year. Uh, and as many of you know, there were quotas uh, against Jewish admissions to Ivy League schools in the early part of the 20th century. So with that, and knowing Gene through that Abraham network, um, and admiring Gene's work so much uh, at the federal level and the state level, uh, is why I asked him to join us today. I wanted just to say, again, can you tell us from your work at the federal level and the state level, what is happening as we get closer to this term, this past term at the court, and then will you give us a sense of the court's majority opinion in the Harvard and UNC cases sure, from sure. this term? Um, first of all, I have to admit to a bit of deja vu. I was in graduate school when Bakke came down and uh, did a master's thesis on affirmative action in the public service, looking at the executive orders of Johnson and Kennedy and others. Um, and so for me, uh, as an academic, long before I became a member of public service, it's always been there, that, that topic, that issue. Um, and I guess the other thing is that if you look at what was going on when I was in Pennsylvania, which is a long time ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, higher education, the flag flagship institutions, the Penn States, um, the Virginias in the various states uh, really did not have and still do not have a great record with regard to the composition and diversity of the student body. Uh, for most of higher education everywhere, as far as I could tell, um, there's more diversity. Maybe not enough, but there is more diversity. Um, I'm talking about uh, places like um, in Pennsylvania, Shippensburg, here, James Madison, Longwood, places like that. Um, that led me, when I was Secretary of Education in Pennsylvania, to do some background analysis. And I did find out, I'm sure it's changed, but uh, Pennsylvania, I should tell you, has 
very similar profile of higher education to Virginia. Very fine public institutions, many, many private institutions. Um, working with the governor's office, working with the State Board of Education, I found out a couple of things that were somewhat disconcerting. Uh, one was that the private institutions had a higher percentage of low income and or minority students than places like Penn State, a land grant institution, places like Pitt. That, that was a surprise to me. Um, and it was disconcerting because these are public institutions that ought to be embracing that larger purpose, especially at Penn State, because it's a land grant. The second thing I found out, and maybe you all know this, but um, they weren't graduating students on a timely basis. In other words, the federal government collects graduation data based upon a six-year degree, even though most people think it's a four-year degree. So when I looked at the landscape in Pennsylvania, I found out that some public institutions, we'll go nameless on this one, <laughs> were far below 50% over six years. In fact, there were two or three uh, that hovered around 10%. 10%. So, um, so that, Gene, that's 10%, only 10% were graduating six years in six years, getting a degree right. in six years. Right. And so I went to the governor and we hatched a plan trying to create an incentive to, in, to graduate students at a higher rate to include in that diversity and to make sure that it was a four year degree, not a six year degree. Uh, so we set aside a, a pot of money, and um, it turns out, I think the 40%, 40 percent was sort of the, the cutoff. If you were able to graduate 40 percent of your undergraduates within four years, or more than 40 percent, you got a slice of this pie. Not one public institution qualified for the money. Uh, a lot of the private institutions did. A lot of the public institutions were not happy. But facts are facts. And that was very, very surprising to me. Um, it was surprising to a lot of tuition payers and parents, too, <laughs> who thought that this was what we were supposed to be getting into. Fast forward to my time uh, in Washington uh, before we get to the decision. Uh, while it's controversial, I understand that. One of the ideas, principal ideas really behind No Child Left Behind was to try to deal with this issue at the front end. In other words, if this nation does a better job of identifying where the problems are in education, don't close your eyes to them. Don't you know, cover them up. It may not be nice to see. It may be, again, discomforting. But that's important if you're going to be able to make sure that, as Lyndon Johnson said, these young people are ready because we've made sure they're ready to be successful in higher education and after that. In many ways, uh, I don't think uh, President Bush gets enough credit for that in the sense that if you look at the law, it wasn't supposed to be fully implemented and fully take effect until years after his administration was over. But the goal really was to focus on the achievement gap. And Gene, we point out as well here at the Miller Center, and we've done programs on this from the George Bush Presidential Oral History right. Project, as well as the Edward Kennedy Oral History Project, that those two men and others, certainly in the Republican yeah. and Democratic Party, get this people, worked across party lines, to come up with policy <laughs> that was helpful. Yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I know, shocking. <laughs> I mean, it, uh, up until recently, that was the last piece of bipartisan legislation that passed Congress, and that was 2001. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's a different time, uh, but there was bipartisanship to the extent that it broke down pretty quickly over budgets, obviously. You know what else is bipartisan? Voting rights, the, the, yeah, the yeah. you know, the. Yeah, the with re Mitch McConnell, supportive. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, Those days let's, are gone. Uh, well, that, that's another forum. Um, <laughs> what we want to do is encourage you to write up your questions.
uh, Alfred Wright is going to be collecting them. So if you have questions for the panel, please do. Um, if you're watching online, uh, please submit those in the um, Q&A function. Um, and so now, Jean, if you will give us um, a brief overview of just Chief Justice Roberts' opinion for the court in the Harvard and the UNC cases from this past yeah. term. Yeah, I, I want to preface it again by noting that um, um, in the introduction by the dean, she mentioned my book, Justice Versus Law, uh, co-wrote that. And the point of that book was to point out that at times there's a disconnect between a popular understanding of what justice is or should be and what the court ruling in a case is. It was a different case, it had nothing to do with affirmative action. But, but I think that kind of epitomizes what I see in this, in this decision. Um, the majority, Justice Roberts, in essence says uh, equal protection means equal protection. You cannot use race to move toward a, a goal because race would violate uh, the 14th Amendment. Um, that's the majority. And to me, uh, what he's doing is saying it, it may be a just outcome to do it. He's not saying that, but I think that certainly the, the uh, dissenters say that. Uh, however, the Constitution says what it says. And then he lays open the possibilities that there are other ways to achieve the diversity, other ways to achieve similar ends. As long as you look at one's life experiences, one's um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, condition with which one uh, goes to school, etc. But he says race cannot be uh, the factor that gets people into school. Uh, and he also says diversity is a laudable goal, goal but, and I'm paraphrasing obviously, uh, it's not adequately understood or defined enough to deal with the strict scrutiny issue. To meet that narrow tailoring. Yeah, tail yeah, yeah. And I, I want to mention Baki again because to me, the problem with Baki is he, uh, he lost the moral argument. The moral argument which is if you consider the totality of an individual's life as they apply to school, if you consider where they come from, um, socioeconomic factors, the challenges they have to go through, then there's an argument to be made for affirmative action. But I, my opinion is that, that the majority in Baki kind of didn't do that. They, and I think that moral argument remains. And that's certainly what the dissenters say. Yeah, well, so let's, let's turn then, thank you, Jean. let's turn to Kimberly again, our, our lawyer on our panel, to tell us about Justice Sotomayor's lead dissent, um, which talks about how she's a product of affirmative action, yeah. interestingly enough. Kimberly. So Justice Mont Sotomayor um, writes a beautiful opinion that really challenges the majority's uh, description of what the Constitution means. So what you need to understand at the heart of this case is a debate over what our Equal Protection Clause means. So the majority very much embraces a colorblind view of the equal protection. And that means we should not be considering race, um, an individual's race, as you're, you're admitting students, at least to the extent that they sort of indicate that by checking a box. The majority does leave the door open to consider an individual speaking about their experience as it relates to race. Um, so that does still... In an essay, for example, in an, in essay. an admissions essay, right. that, that they say if you are asked to write about challenges you've overcome, the student who is applying could write about race as a hardship overcome. Yes. But Justice Sotomayor challenges the majority's description of history and says from its inception, the Equal Protection Clause recognized that looking at race was essential to accomplish the very things that President Johnson mentioned, which is that you had a newly freed, formerly enslaved population, and to accomplish equality when the 
um, discrimination and, and injustice and slavery had happened because of race. You had to look at race to provide particular benefits. So for example, if you look at the Freedmen's Bureau, there are, just as Sotomayor notes, how the programs to benefit those who were newly freed focused on the prior status of the individuals who were enslaved. And so the Freedmen's Bureau, one of its biggest programs was education, in part because education is the linchpin for freedom. If you don't have an education, you are not truly free. And so what Justice Sotomayor does is walks us through that early history where the Congress, the ratifying Congress, rejected arguments that this Constitution is colorblind and, reject, and passed laws recognizing race and using race. And then she takes us through how the court essentially turned its back uh, and, uh, on what the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause was in Plessy versus Ferguson by allowing separate but equal to become the law of the land and really goes through the history to challenge what our Constitution means and says that con the Constitution does not demand that we close our eyes to race because we have a society that is deeply affected by race. And by simply closing your eyes to something, it doesn't make it go away. Instead, what she says is, to a truly achieve equal opportunity, as the lawyers who were arguing Brown um, were aiming to do, you have to be able to uh, acknowledge race. And so she explains sort of that history from the passage of the 14th Amendment all the way up to the, pres to the present. She also challenges the majority's reading of precedent. So for example, as I said, uh, or the majority questioned the ability to measure the benefits of diversity. However, there is significant social science research showing that there are tangible benefits to having people who are different across racial backgrounds together in educational environments. And so Justice Sotomayor really walks through not only that history, but also notes that you know, the court in Grutter upheld uh, diversity as a compelling interest, you know, building upon these benefits. And these benefits matter for the reasons that I mentioned before, creating leaders with legitimacy in the eyes of the public, um, having dialogue across difference. And so she very much challenges the um, dissent's reading of the past cases. Um, because the, I'm sorry, not the to the majority. Dissent, the majority's reading of the past cases. So you have very two, I think at the heart of her dissent is a very different understanding of the Equal Protection Clause that seeks to recognize our very, um, it's hard to come up with the right adjective for it, but our painful history with racial segregation and discrimination. And it's recognizing that we have to wrestle with, acknowledge, and work to redress that as we think about admissions to elite institutions. And before we get to our audience questions, Kevin, I have one, one last question for you, and that is, in, given your vast understanding of the broad sweep of civil rights history and social justice history, um, did you make anything of the footnote in Chief Justice Roberts's majority opinion in which he explicitly states that the court is not addressing uh, racial considerations for admission to U.S. military academies? Well, yes. I mean, in, historically, civil rights reforms and, and advancements for African Americans have often been tied to a sort of a, a, a larger purpose. Um, Derek Bell describes this as the interest convergence theory, and he looks at the Brown decision as happening when it did in 1954, um, not because it was the right thing to do, but um, because it happened to sort of the, the, the broader context was the Cold War and the ideological struggle of the United States to prove that it was actually what it said it was, which was the leader of the free world. And so um, there's a recognition 
within the U.S. foreign policy establishment. Um, and, and, and I think that understanding that um, Brown was needed at that time or a prominent civil rights reform was needed at, at that time because um, it was tied to national security. And so the, the, the unanimous decision uh, of, of the court behind Brown um, didn't really um, acknowledge that as explicitly, but um, obviously they were responding to these broader pressures. And I think you can make that case for, for other kinds of, of racial advances. The Emancipation Proclamation by Lincoln was, was issued as uh, you know, a, a war policy because you know, Lincoln could see that this war was going on and there was going to be a need for more manpower. So he's thinking, how can I get um, freed African Americans to fight for the Union Army? So I think the, uh, and, and let's face it, the military has been kind of like the showcase example for racial integration. Uh, and for affirmative action to show the success of, of those policies. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the, the justices, the dissenting justices, talk more broadly about the social benefits of diversity and diverse workforces, uh, a div diverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, people in the professions, that there's obviously a social benefit to that. But, you know, it seems like that's one area where um, making the, the case for race conscious uh, admissions policies is less controversial. Right. Jean, hold that thought. Um, we, we have a question from our online audience and uh, because we have a diverse in-person audience today here at the Miller Center, I think it's uh, particularly important to, to ask this question of our panel. It says again from our online audience, during the next 50 years the Hispanic population will rise and so will the Asian American population. The white population will decline. Black population will be stagnant or decline. How will these trends uh, redefine uh, the diversity concept in the United States? Anyone want to jump in with that? Obviously not. <laughs> no, well I, 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 well, I will. I mean, I think that one of the arguments that the dissenters made was that uh, race conscious admissions and diversity in, in our, you know, uh, you know more, more, most powerful and influential social institutions is really an imperative for legi the legitimacy of democracy. If you don't have, you know, sort of adequate representation of uh, historically underrepresented groups, in business, in the arts, and, and cultural institutions, in higher education, et cetera, if you don't have um, uh, diverse populations uh, among the leaders of our society, then it really sort of creates a crisis of legitimacy for our democracy. And so I think we, uh, with those changing demographics, we really need to think about um, how the leadership of our society is going to look. And race conscious affirmative action has caused a bunch of uh, a, a considerable amount of progress. I don't think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a limited policy. It's a moderate policy. It's really kind of striking that there has been so much controversy over it when the, the real problem, the elephant in the room of legacy admissions, which is really a tremendous preference that really limits the access um, uh, to higher education, of most people, regardless of their background, and of course, legacy admissions is um, Im implicitly a white privilege. Um, I, I think getting rid of affirmative action, race-based affirmative action, is not going to solve these problems of access for higher education. And I think as we move towards an um, even more diverse society, I, I think of uh, Sotomayor's conclusion of her dissent when she said, hey, you, the United States is a multicultural society. It's only going to become more so, and diversity is a core value. And so um, even though the court has ruled against race-conscious affirmative action in this case, the pursuit for a diverse society is going to continue. Now, Professor Abraham, who embraced American culture but maintained his Germanic uh, timeliness, would have made a stop exactly at noon. But since we started just a few minutes tardy because I had to run back to get my glasses so I could read the questions, <laughs> I've been given a dispensation, as we say in my Catholic faith, to go a few minutes beyond. So, Jean, I want to circle back to you. You had a point. Uh, 
the question was what's going to go, what's going to happen going forward. Yes. And I, you know, maybe I'm somewhat of a Pollyanna here, but my hope is that we focus less on Supreme Court decisions and policies and more upon who we are, where we want to go as a people and understand that the America we are now inheriting is dramatically different and I would argue dramatically better and that one of the problems we've had over the years is we, we allow statutes and constitutional decisions to find the conversation. And I think we need to get something like, you, like you're saying. I think we need to get beyond that. I really do. Now, having said that, given the current environment in America, that's more difficult than ever. Well, not than ever, but certainly more difficult than recent history. Um, you mentioned bipartisanship with No Child Left Behind. The fact is there was a time when we could, as a people, have these conversations and not you know, dissolve into tribes and refuse to talk to each other. We're not going to be successful going forward with a democracy if we don't learn how to be a democratic people, and that includes everyone. So for me, uh, again, that may sound Pollyanna, but conversations like this that take place in rooms like this as opposed to litigation, which a lot of people, it, it's just not, does it make sense to them? Tell me what it means. And I, I just think we as a people do need to have many more rich conversations, many of them difficult, but that's going to be necessary, and I think it will happen. Well, as Alexis de Tocqueville noticed in the 1830s yes. as he traveled around the United States, uh, he said, I, I think what I'm noticing that in this country, as a Frenchman, he was saying, it seems like eventually every political issue will end up as a judicial issue. Yeah. So um, it, it, it's a good goal to think that we wouldn't always have to go uh, to court. But um, I think I will end uh, today with a statement from Chief Justice Charles Evans Hughes, who in laying the cornerstone of what was the new court building, you might not realize that the U.S. Supreme Court did not have its own building until the 1930s in the midst of the depression and led at that time by uh, Chief Justice William Howard Taft decided the court should have its own building. And so that beautiful marble palace, as it is called, across from the capital of the United States, uh, laying the cornerstone, uh, he said, the republic endures and this is a symbol of its faith. Yeah. And that may be Pollyanna too, but I'll yeah. think of it as Chief <laughs> Justice Hughes rather than uh, Pollyanna, but in the midst of the depression where uh, there were uprisings among, on the left and the right, extremists, uh, fascism in this country was uh, on the march, socialism and communism was on the march. It wasn't clear that the system would hold and that the center would hold, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will. But I want to thank you all today for being here. I'm sure that if our panel doesn't have to run off to teach and do the work that they do here at the university and beyond, they'd be willing to take more of your questions. But just thank you for your attentiveness and, and listening, and, and let's thank this panel for its civility today. Thank you.